1942. The Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union had brought war on a catastrophic scale deep inside the Russian interior. One final stronghold remained in Hitler's way. At Stalingrad, German forces were locked in a deadly struggle with the city's beleaguered Red Army defenders. In the terrible battle, half a million Nazi troops were killed, wounded, or captured, and more than three quarters of a million Russians. But far from being the last step in the Nazi conquest, the fight for the ruined city proved a bloody failure for the Germans. Why did Hitler's forces lose the battle for Stalingrad? In late 1942, the Second World War was in its third year. Nazi forces had reached more than 500 miles into the Soviet Union. Their objective, the vast natural reserves of the Russian interior. For Hitler, the attack on the Soviet Union had several purposes. He wanted to destroy Jewish Bolshevism, which he saw as his major world enemy. But on the other hand, he also wanted the vast resources of the Soviet Union, because he knew he could then build a huge German economic empire. The majority of these resources lay in the east of the Soviet Union. Most valuable of all were the huge oil fields of the Caucasus. To capture these, Hitler unleashed the panzer divisions of his 6th Army. The Nazi Blitzkrieg tore across the Russian steppe. The last obstacle that lay in Germany's way was the city of Stalingrad. Well, Stalingrad becomes uh, an important object of the German army kind of by accident because the real objective of the offensive was the Caucasus and the oil. There's nothing particularly valuable in Stalingrad. It, it does control the, the river line from the Volga. Once you'd captured Stalingrad, you could cut the Volga. Once you cut the Volga, you stopped the oil flowing from the Caucasus. From the German point of view, Stalingrad made increasing strategic sense. Hitler and his commanders were confident that the city would be in German hands in just a few days. But Stalingrad did not fall. Somehow, the Russians held out against the mighty German army. For 200 days, the savage battle raged on until the Red Army forced the surrender of Nazi forces in the city. How did this extraordinary turnaround come about? The Germans were well-trained and highly equipped with a string of victories behind them. By comparison, the Red Army was inexperienced and old-fashioned. Legend has it that the Germans were unprepared for the savage Russian winter. But the latest research is now showing that familiarity with freezing weather was not the only ace up the Red Army's sleeve. August 23, 1942. For the initial assault on Stalingrad, the Germans unleashed the full power of Blitzkrieg. One of the first things the Germans decided to do in Stalingrad, of course, was to mount a huge bombing attack on the city. I think they assumed that this would accelerate defeat, it would demoralize the defenders, it would create panic among the population. Mass bombing raids decimated the city. More than 40,000 civilians were killed. German artillery fire also rained down. In just a few days, Stalingrad was transformed into a shattered maze of ruins. Yet despite this, the population didn't panic. The Red Army wasn't demoralized. Why didn't overwhelming German firepower prevail? More than 60 years later, the city has been completely rebuilt. It's now known as Volgograd. David Hatton is a blast consultant 
a specialist in how structures are affected by explosive force. He's come to Volgograd to investigate the way the city's buildings were affected by the Nazi bombing. He suspects this may be the first step in understanding why the Nazis were unable to take Stalingrad. A few of the buildings still bear traces of the fighting. Here in this passageway between two of the, these early surviving buildings, we can see some of the damage. On the wall above us, there's a whole range of bullet holes. And further over to the corner, we can see an area where the brickwork looks rough. That's where a hole was punched through the, the wall. The brick fragments were collected, and the whole thing was recreated to um, reinstate the building to its former condition. In the decades since the battle, much of the original damage has been repaired in this way. So for more evidence of the city's appearance during the fighting, Haddon visits a unique museum. It's entirely dedicated to the battle for Stalingrad. It holds a collection of original documents and photographs of the city during the war. Researchers at the museum used information like this to produce a survey of the city's battle damage. The result was this amazing model. More than 20 feet long, it's an exact record of what downtown Stalingrad looked like at the end of the battle. This is an amazingly detailed model built up from thousands of records and photographs taken at the time, which shows the whole city and really shows what a terrifying place it must have been at the height of the battle. Despite being pounded with more than 100,000 tons of bombs, Stalingrad was not completely razed to the ground. The model shows that a surprising number of the city's buildings remained standing. But Haddon has noticed something about the pattern of the devastation. I think some of the things that come out of it are just how well preserved the street plan still still is even after all the destruction that's taken place. Um, where damage has occurred to buildings, the debris seems to have generally fallen within the footprint of the building itself rather than being spread outside. Maybe this is a clue as to how the German attack failed. To investigate further, Haddon needs to get a closer look at a surviving Stalingrad building. He is given special access to the city's flour mill. It's the only remaining structure to have been preserved exactly as it was at the end of the war. Overlooking the Volga, the mill was one of the city's most distinctive landmarks. It was the scene of fierce fighting. This is a tremendous, uh, really sturdy looking structure. It's um, obviously brickwork on the outside. It's about five stories high, very thick, sturdy walls. But I'm really interested to see the structure inside, just to see how that might help to tie the whole building together. But on the inside, Haddon finds that the flour mill's brick exterior is deceptive. Wow. Look at this uh, fantastic structure. It uh, really looks like a, a classic example of early reinforced concrete. Reinforced concrete was the material of choice for Stalin's mass building programs of the 1930s. It was a relatively new technique at the time. Exploring the building, Haddon finds hundreds of holes made by artillery and mortar rounds. The concrete steel reinforcing bars seem to have limited these smaller hits. But at the top of the building, there is evidence of at least one massive aerial bomb impact. How did the flour mill survive this? Haddon believes this has to do with the way the building reacted to an explosive blast. The explosion of a bomb creates a wave of energy. Blast is most destructive when contained. For example, when a bomb explodes inside an undamaged building. Haddon has generated a computer model to show what happens in such an explosion. You see here the initial explosion taking place and the, the shock wave rushing out and then hitting the walls and the roof and, and the, the floor of, of this little chamber and because it's trapped there's nowhere for the explosive to go so it, it keeps coming back it keeps hitting the walls time and time again and that makes the damage potentially 